we do very few takes, and we do very few setups carefully chosen, and he thinks about it a lot, how he's going to use the material, because it's pretty daring to do very few shots. Sometimes we only do one in a scene, giving no chance to alter the rhythm of the scene afterwards. So everything has to be perfect, everything has to work. Did you play? You can usually tell by the rushes how a director wants the scene to be cut, unless they had no idea at all, which is not unknown. But David knows how he wants it to be, so he won't shoot angles that he doesn't specifically want for a specific reason. Is it too low when I'm looking at the guns? You know what? It's out of frame, and I love it. Okay. It's a totally out of, When he takes it out, we see it a bit, then it goes out of frame, then you play with it, then it comes back up with it, this is perfect. It makes it more difficult for me to try other things, but it's not difficult to get to where he wants it to be. Working with Ron Sanders, my director's cut is finished after two or three weeks, and that's because Ron is so good, and he really understands why I do the things I do. You know, a week after we finished shooting, he had his cut, which is sort of, he doesn't even want to call it a, a rough cut, he wants to call it an assembly, because he doesn't want to be presumptuous and say this is really good. But it was really good. And, in, and so I had my director's cut two days later. Two days. This was a new record for me. I don't know which movie I'm looking at. I'm sure it's great. What about that one little spark that flies out to the right? Uh, this was the spark of the shell. Oh, uh, was it? Yeah. Well, I don't want to hear the shell. The big moment, yeah. It just pops out of nowhere. Okay. It's funny because my agent, when she says, read it, there's some real twists and turns. She wouldn't tell me what was going on. And then when I got to that point, I thought, oh, wow, this is a breakthrough in their relationship or something. Like, they're starting to connect in a deeper way, thinking, oh, wow, they're going to become friends. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> I was really shocked. It just kind of like jumps out of the darkness and just goes, boo. Yeah, that, that last moment. So it's my last moment. He's so knowledgeable about the world. He tries to stay so educated about contemporary events that they become unreal to him. And so even when people are shooting at him and even when he shoots someone himself, it's not reality. It's just, it's all just to feel something. It's like he's gone through the sort of finding yourself phase of adolescence and they're not only not finished it, but it's kind of spiraling out of control. And also combined with phenomenal intelligence and analytical skills, he's, uh, he's just driving himself crazy. <laughs> Jesus Christ, he's just trying to get a fucking haircut. That's <laughs> it's just a guy in a car. <laughs> Action. David and I had a conversation right at the beginning about the format on which the film would be shot, and he decided that this would be the first film on which he would experiment with digital photography. So the entire film is shot on a new Ari Alexa digital camera. When I've seen everybody in still photography acquiring digital cameras, and David, I've seen him buy I don't know how many digital cameras, I've stuck to film. But last year I had the feeling that the days of film were severely limited, and so I said, let's try a digital camera. Yeah, George, if you keep your arms straight, that puts you in the light nicely. How's that? That's good. 143, take two. This is my first time without film. What counts is the final result on the screen. There are some frustrations associated with it on the way to getting the result, but the result is very, very good indeed. It looks like film, but it's better than film. It's got more detail, greater subtlety, no scratches, no jiggle from the projector, but above all, it's beautiful to look at, and it's very sensitive to low light. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I can so bring we can the guys back in and forth. Uh, we'll do a sequence. Uh, to set up. It was definitely my desire to shoot chronologically. It's often not important, but I think in this movie, because so much of it is on a set, we could shoot it chronologically, and I thought that would be really helpful for me because then I could watch it evolve before my very eyes and gently guide it, gently guide it. Uh, whereas if you're shooting the last scene first where the actors don't know how they got to that point yet because they haven't had that journey, that can be very tricky. So were you going to do this with one shot? No. Oh, good. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just 
It's not a cliched concept, the script, because the psychology of the characters is so strange and unusual. Nothing was obvious. And we were all kind of inventing the psychology in a way to make that unusual dialogue work. Much as I love the pie on your face, I think we need to not have it, because I've sort of been assuming you'd have it on your face right to the end of the movie. But in fact, I don't think you can. It makes comments about everything else. Yeah, you would say something yeah, like, yeah. "Why do you have pie on your face?" <laughs> it's not, you know. And I don't want to, I really don't want to make an issue out of that because we've got enough <laughs> other stuff going on, you know. Well, yeah. you want me to answer the lines then? No, no, I don't. I don't. Okay. I think we got enough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> From three quarters of the way through the movie on, then there's a build to something, and that, that kind of helped to shoot it in uh, chronological order. But um, for the first, yeah, definitely for the first half of the movie, he's just having experiences, so it doesn't really make any difference. Ever seen such ratty hair on a human? He wants his hair to be destroyed, <laughs> and you're the man to do it. Oh, does he really? <laughs> I don't know. I'll take that as a challenge. <laughs> He's just constantly looking for something, and every day is exactly the same, and he doesn't know what he's looking for. I need to leave. How come? I don't know how come. That's how come. He has a descent to the end of the movie, which is totally unaffected by anyone other than Benno. I mean, there's something just going on inside his own head. I met Don DeLillo, and he said, you know, I really was wondering how he would handle the Benno journal thing. The Benno journal thing is that you discover a lot about Benno internally because he's writing a diary, basically, and it's presented in a couple of chapters in the book. So this is good. Yeah? Yeah. So we have it. Okay. I was interested to see, said Don, the way you dealt with it was that you just ignored it. <laughs> In other words, I don't deal with it at all. I don't have Benno writing a diary. I don't have him reading from his diary. And therefore, there are some things that we don't get that we would have gotten if we read the book. On the other hand, it leaves Benno as a complete surprise and a very strong character who comes in for the last maybe 15 minutes of the movie when it casts a whole light back towards the movie that you've seen. So seeing the movie a second time is really quite different now that you know that Benno's going to arrive at a certain point. I've never read the novel that it's based on. I didn't want to. But in order to prepare somewhat for this, I read another book of his that I'd never read called Mao 2, which was written in 1991. And there's even stuff in that literally about the World Trade Center and what would happen if it got blown up. So he's always been deeply preoccupied with terrorism and violence and things like that, that he was predicting that sort of thing then. It's really eerie. So is this, in a weird way. As surreal as it is, there's something completely real and believable about it. Okay, guys, let's do our finals, please. Finals. Pictures up. Well, it's an interesting thing that they left this to the last. It's the last thing. He lands in here. We'd never met each other before. And I was a little bit like, oh, we don't get for to rehearse when I get to meet each other. In some ways, it was good. And I also think the fact that we couldn't be more different physically is great. I mean, it's like two guys who are really different from each other. This is the Stéphane Dupuis School of Beauty and Elegance. And right now, I am making Paul look like shit. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Age spots. <laughs> uh, so freck freckles. Yeah, I'm so youthful and fresh. He has to add in spots. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm just making it a lot worse by adding, like, skin discoloration before they put the hairpiece on. This is a fun piece that we did. And Paul had his hair cut for a different show. That's right. I'm not actually this Paul. Hmm? I just want America to know whoever <laughs> <laughs> but, the world he, but we ended up putting these pieces on to to give him a comb over for a character he wears a towel in the scene and takes it off so the piece itself doesn't rise and glue hair to hair so that some of the hair will rise and and the hair that's glued will will keep the piece tight to the head so this still lifts and then you put a little bit on the top just to hold certain hairs down and then the rest will lift and move and do whatever you require without it all coming out in the towel. Ready and right. After shooting the limo for so long, it was 
quite nerve-wracking to get out and working in a normal environment where we're both equals and we had to figure out the set at the same time. Give me a drink. Give me a drink. It was suddenly like you're all off kilter afterwards, which was great for that scene. I kind of like the idea of sitting after the shot. It's time for a philosophical pause, some reflection, yes. And then that's the kind of the image. It's like, you're not familiar with that weapon. Yeah. I mean, does that work? I mean, yeah. you could do it the other way. Yeah. Said no. Sit and talk. I've had a long day. Things and people. Time for a philosophical pause. Robert. It's just uh, everything about him seems really right. I mean, he does have this unearthly quality. But what was great of what I've seen of what Robert did is that there's moments where you just see the mask that he's wearing slip just a little bit, and you can see that there's somebody in there who doesn't know what the fuck is going on, you know? And so it really comes off in lots of ways in this scene, I think. Why are you here? Is the first thing I said to you when I came out of the toilet. I noticed the toilet. The first thing I noticed when I came out of the... I actually thought that was perfect. What can I say? <laughs> Who is directing? <laughs> is it Dean? <laughs> is it your agent? In my head. <laughs> is she in your trailer? <laughs> well, this is great. I really, I think we should just check. There was that small yeah. overlap. Right? I know. Of course. Yeah, it's quite small. Okay. Not a biggie. Yeah. Really? What? 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 Okay. Saw the wire. Uh, there may be a, more of an issue. Yeah. What's it? Yeah. Oh yeah, shit. That was the one thing I noticed. Yeah. I, what? I put it away. <laughs> Put what away? It's a wire. wire. Um, I was only poking out a little. I don't know how much you could see it. I mean. Oh, did, did, did this is Mike. Yes. I saw it. You saw it? Right here. I was looking. Oh, that. Forget yeah. about it. <laughs> 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 All right, let's think of something else. If the wire is there, we can DI it out. It's no problem. Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's just to make sure. Yeah, and then he, when he says the weapon line, he left out one of the weapons. I fired that one. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a serious weapon. I was trying to avoid saying what was going to happen. No, no, it's not going to happen. Avoid saying anything at all. Right, and there's one other one. I don't know. Who are you? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, what did I say? Tell me. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, let's go right away. Tell me who you think I am. I don't know. Who are you? The character is really <laughs> an odd character. He is some kind of moral compass. I mean, he's some sort of maybe alter ego almost. And I tell him things about himself that he knows. He tells me things about myself that I know. Well, when you shine it at him, you're shining it with that. And in some ways, it's the most intimate conversation anybody has. Even though there's a scene where people are having sex and they're talking, there's a detachment all the time from no, either from him or from both people I and mean, this is actually the one conversation where they're not so detached so that seems to lend it some kind of different weight you want me to be a helpless <laughs> robot soldier and all i could be was helpless it's the most loving scene even though i hate him and want to kill him what are you doing i don't know maybe nothing <laughs> the blood happens halfway through the shot, so let's get a sponge here. Danny, can you bring in the uh, bloody sponge, please? Why don't you bring the two that you had here, Danny? The ones that are already soaked. This should be enough. Lean forward. That's when you palm it. You come up, and then Beno comes over, and then we get the running blood. <laughs> When Paul came up and he held my hand, there was so much more tenderness to it, which is not how I read the scene at all, which is how a lot of the scenes happened. I mean, you get there, and I, I read them in one way, and the actors who came in came in with totally different energies, and it really affected the way I saw the character. Eric definitely has suicidal thoughts, but he has such an all-consuming ego. And there's a line in the book saying, when he dies, the world will end. And I think he feels, by killing himself, it shows that he has power to end the world at all times. Violence needs 
a burden. I love the talking about here. That was so good. That was great. I could hear the. Cl- I'm glad you didn't worry about your teeth. <laughs> I could hear the clink. It whistled as well. It yeah, it was, I wish it put that off early enough. It makes a nice little touch. It makes something have a lisp. No one else has tried to kill him before. And because it's kind of random circumstances and it's sort of combined with fate and destiny, he assumes at first that Benno is some kind of higher power who's come down and he says, you're not the only one who can destroy you, I can destroy you. And he thinks there's some kind of deeper meaning to it and so looks to Benno for some kind of explanation to his life. What does it mean? You should have listened to your prostate. That's where the answer was in your body. And then he just finds out that Benno's really just crazy and categorizable. So it's a kind of disappointing way to go. He didn't find out anything. Okay, show us the gun. Nice, just grab here. Good. Please check it. Thank you. And roll it. 181, take one. Worker. I still need to shoot you. I'm willing to discuss it. But there's no life for me if I don't do this. There are very truthful things coming out of the mouth of somebody who's very irrational, who's been pushed beyond some sort of limit. You have to die no matter what. It makes it tricky to take it in because you're getting something from a crazy person. He is crazy, but it makes sense, unfortunately. I mean, there's lots of very uncomfortable truths about things that he's saying. Even if a fungus told me to kill you, even then your death is justified because of where you stand on the earth. For your apartment and what you paid for it. For your daily medical checkups. This alone! For the limousine that displaces the air that people need to breathe in Bangladesh. Don't make me laugh. Don't make you laugh. You just made that up. You've never spent a minute of your life worrying about other people. In this scene, it becomes a good question, who's crazier? He may be crazier than me. I mean, there's a very complicated thing going on throughout the scene about whether he goads me into killing him, whether I really was going to kill him and he makes me kill him. I mean, it's very complicated. He may be crazy. Shut the fuck up for my fucking life. Jesus fucking Christ. I do know that in the book, you know he's dead. And in this, you don't see him killed. You don't see that he's dead. You don't know that he's dead. It's great that you don't. I think I do kill him. I mean, I think I am going to kill him. But it is interesting that it ends there and you don't get that. It's a really interesting thing. You don't get the satisfaction in a crazy, weird way of seeing him killed. And I don't actually have to shoot him. He's dead. I wanted you to save me. It's ambiguous whether I actually do it or not. But I don't know that I need to. Don't shoot. I could just stand, that's it. That's, we're, that's, those two guys are left like that for eternity. Almost bursting into tears. Now that I didn't expect. Really, I'm shaking. <laughs> Fantastic. Really, guys, that was incredible. I wanted to forget something. You did everything. <laughs> All those ideas of the things you should have done, stink. <laughs> no good. I definitely the whole time had the confidence in David that I knew he was up to something <laughs> and I didn't know what it was, which is one of the best feelings in the world. Awesome. It's not up to you what the movie's about. You're not dictating it. And you can watch it afterwards and feel like, oh. And it's a it's by itself, it's it's unconnected to me. It's his movie. And in a strange sort of way, it takes quite a lot of courage to really say that. And the trick is that we need to be able to see that little fleeting glimpse of Elise way back. I mean, it's really only because of David that a film like this can be made the way it has been made. I mean, it's completely unapologetically anti-Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, it's almost ridiculous. Museum quality video for the ages. Things like this never, ever get made. And it's an honor to be part of it.